house of the Lord, to be in His presence, to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, He loves the praises of His children. And when we gather together, He is so happy. And if you have any prayers, please send them in to us. Text them to 407-490-4019. We'd love to pray for you. The word says we're two or more gathered in his name, that he's in the midst of us. So we'd love to pray for you. 407-490-4019. And now we're going to declare Psalm 91. If you can go to Psalm 91 in your Bible or just repeat after us, there's power in numbers, and we're going to continue declaring this because he is our refuge and our strength and our fortress. So let's declare this now together. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. And surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid and turn by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor destruction that lays waste in the day. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. And only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And now let's welcome Pastor Street. He has an awesome sweatshirt that he's wearing today. And he will bless us with the word. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. One nation under God. Amen. 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 <laughs> we serve a great God and it'll do well. This nation will do well being under him. Amen. 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 So, all right. Uh, for today's uh, Bible study, um, I hope you guys are all doing well. The people that are joining us online. I believe you're doing well with everything. Our prayers are with you and anything and everything that God is doing. We are very excited to be a part of your life and uh, you know it's been a great journey with God and I'm so thankful that we can enter into this uh, new year with a, a, a covenant with Him and having that uh, provision working for us and working into our lives, I'm very thankful that we can face anything that comes across us. Amen. Hope you guys had a wonderful uh, time, good time with the Lord when you were going through the time of fasting and prayer. I just want to remind you again, don't forget this Friday night is our Friday night of prayer. Come prepared, whatever God has laid on your heart. Let that be a time of prophecy. Let that be a time of confirmation. Let that be a time of inspiration. Let that be a time where visions will be stirred up. That is my main prayer, that God will stir up. You know, many of us have forgotten what God has called you and what it means for us to be in the midst of it. One of the things that God has laid on my heart is, let my people dream. Encourage my people to dream. Encourage my people to have visions. Because that is how God is directing us. That is how he wants to direct us and lead us. And I, I even this morning I was talking to a sister and she was talking. I mean the last two years God has been speaking to me through dreams. I'm like yes. Let us, let us be a part of it. That is part of what has been prophesied in the book of uh, Acts, uh, according uh, uh, to the prophet, of, prophet Joel, even you will see it, that he will pour out his spirit. 
that that man will uh, uh, ma his man and his his maid servant and his man servants will dream dreams and will have visions and yeah. and th those things this is this is the time for us to experience those things more than ever before amen, amen? amen. so i pray for that and i'm praying that god will be stirring us up more so we may experience all that God has in store for us. Amen. 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 Not some of it, but all of it. Amen. 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 I don't want you to have some of it. How many of you believe God doesn't want you to have some of it? Amen. He wants you to have all, all of, it. of it. His ministry, you know, this, these days we see these uh, 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 so-called people saying, oh, holistic healing and all those kinds of things. But God is the inventor of all of that. Amen. Hey. He's the one who wants to minister to you in every aspect of your life. Amen. Spirit, soul, and body. Amen. Amen. You know, he wants to minister to you in every area. He never wants to neglect you in very any area. Only reason you didn't have him, or only reason you didn't experience him in certain areas is because you didn't believe. Simple. Simple as that. Many have faith to believe that Jesus is my savior. Yes. But the same people have hard time believing Jesus is my financier. True. Anyway. He is both. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you don't want to believe it, that's fine. He's not going to push himself to be your financier. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So uh, it's, it's up to us how, we, how much we believe and how, how much we are willing to let go of ourselves. Many times believing is letting go of ourselves. Because we are trading ourselves with him. That is belief. But anyway, um, this is something God has laid on my heart to deal with in this uh, new year as a starting. Um, the title of this Bible study, Be Prepared for It, it is Lamentations. Lamentations, the subtitle uh, I have given it is Inner Cry. Inner Cry, and today would be the starting of it. One of the reasons uh, I really want to deal with this topic is, no matter how old you are, no matter how young you might be, um, in life as we walk in, one of the things that we all face is Sorrow, suffering, yes. grief, pain. Yep. We face through those things. And my objective for this Bible study is to be able to deal with that. Deal with grief. Especially, you all know this, but I just want to, uh, uh, for the sake of, I want to repeat, as you know, uh, when I lost my parents back to bay, back in a span of 72 hours uh, in the year uh, 2020, when I lost them, there is one thing that hit me very hard, that is grief. Yes. The sorrow that have come with it. It hit me very, very hard. You know, I thought I was prepared for it. I thought I knew what is coming. But I also realized how real grief is. Yes, yes. Even when you know what is going to happen, you still will be hit by grief. Yes. You can't yes. stop it from happening. Yeah. And unfortunately, in the society that we live in, we haven't figured out how to deal with grief. These are the two categories that I see more dominant than anything. One, who is an addict to grief. Whether you realize it or not, grief is an addiction. That's true. <clears throat> Many people don't realize, but they are stuck in grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the second people, second group I have seen is, they don't want to deal with grief. <clears throat> They ignore grief. People who ignore grief. 
And that's one of the reasons if you really look at it, many times when our uh, heroes, the men and women of God, women that went to war, they have seen their friends, the people that they walked with died right in front of them. <coughs> but they were never given an opportunity to grieve. When they have not grieved, what happens? It is mounted in them, and most of the times that is one of the main reasons where these war heroes come home with PTSD. Because the grief <coughs> that they had, the sorrow that they had, they never had an opportunity to deal with. And that is another wrong label that they put on men. If you see men crying, you'd be like, why are you being like a girl? That's a, another disadvantage that we create as a society for men. Or even for women, many times if you're crying, you will be seen as a weak person. Oftentimes cry is seen as a weak person, weak, weak, uh, weaker attribute of a person, not a strong attribute. To a point it is right. <coughs> to a point it is right, but there is a balance that I like for us to figure out also. There is a balance because God doesn't want us to be living in that cry. At the same time, God doesn't want us to not cry. Right. Both of them are true. Because the Bible says he gave us the joy of the Lord. True. You know, when you are given the joy of the Lord, you can't be living in cry every day. On the other side, Bible also says there is a time for you to cry, there is a time for you to laugh. Yeah. Amen. So figuring out the balance of it, I think that is one of the beautiful things of life is that how we can figure out the balance. Either most of the people are on this extreme or they are on this extreme. The true victory is always in the balance. Have you ever seen the world go into the extreme? As much as we feel like it, as much as we feel like this is the last day. You know, whether the times when we live through hurricanes, we, we will feel, we will experience the whole house rattling, shaking and falling and things are running around and all those kinds of things. We experience those heavy winds. Yet, after that is gone, we are still here. True. <coughs> Amen? Amen? So, uh, it, this is an integral part of our life, and this is an important piece of our life. Had I not learned how to deal with grief and the sorrow that comes with it, if I don't learn how to deal with it, you will be stuck. That's true. That is a very yeah. big disadvantage for you. And let me be very honest with you, it's going to be a vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. It is not going to be something that comes and goes. Many times you have people experience long-term headaches because of grief. And even long-term long -term anxiety attacks because they haven't grieved. They haven't dealt with that. Many times we go through those phases. Many times I have seen people being sick because they have not grieved. That's true. Yeah. I also saw the same reactions when they ignore grief. Or when they have given themselves overly to it. Either way I have seen these extreme manifestations in people's lives. And you see that time and time again. So instead of trying to uh, uh, put labels at certain things, I want us to not only, uh, I want us to deal with this thing in a perspective, what I would like to call, what is the purpose of cry? Why do we cry? Why should we cry? The same thing can be used for good or bad. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, look at this. We all celebrate this uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize, right? 
We all celebrate, the people are all about it, and they talk about the Nobel Prize. When you get the Nobel Prize, oh my goodness, you know, this is a, a guy who won the Nobel Prize and all those kinds of things. But the truth is, this guy invented dynamite. Where's the uh, Okay, l l look, check the irony in it, uh, right? Yeah. He invented the dynamite, he is giving peace prizes. <laughs> and we celebrate it. <laughs> All the money he made off of dynamite, he funds this. Alfred Nobel. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave to <laughs> leave you to that. But uh, we have to understand a problem that is not dealt is not solved. When you don't deal with the problem, it will never get solved. If you ever face something, you have to deal with the problem. If you deal with the problem, then you will find a solution. Solve the problem. Problems are meant for solution. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Problems are meant for solution. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. Mm -hmm. The way includes solution. No matter what I get, uh, what I get, you know, every now and then, uh, 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 um, Pam and myself, we get into conversations, you know, um, when we are dealing with some of the software kind of a things. I mean, when, when I was working with, uh, the big thing that one of the things that we really do is that many times we come across problems that we can't solve. Our knowledge, our experience never went there. So the thing that we do is, uh, 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 one of the main things, I mean, like, uh, 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 is we seek the solution. You know, we couldn't find it anywhere else, so we go to the solver. And when we ask of him, he somehow gives a wisdom or an insight uh, or that, that translates into a solution. So if he can solve computer programming problems, I'm sure he can solve your life programming problems. Yes. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, um, I want us to go at this thing understanding the purpose of our cry. You know, this is something I always talk to my wife, don't cry for everything. You know, for, for women, usually, I'm not saying it's all, but women, for usually, their immediate reaction for anything is cry. They cry for everything. What I like to say is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to point out those things as we go further. Don't waste your tears. In God's sight, they are very valuable. The Bible says he puts them in a jar. He counts every tear. So let your tear count. Don't let your tear be a tear that is of no value. Because your cry can change things. You know, this was one thing that uh, 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 we have as a, as a rule in our house. My dad never wanted us to wake up crying. When we wake up in the morning, we best be in a good mood. For him, his sentiment is if you wake up crying, your whole day is going to be Ruined. sorrow. That's his sentiment. To a point, there is truth to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because how you start is how you end. So it's best for you to start with a spirit of joy. When you start with a spirit of joy, your day will go, will go joyfully, no matter what. Uh, uh, so one of the reasons I want us to is your cry should have a value. God looks at your cry valuable. So when you consider something valuable, you don't use it for any common use. Are you with me here? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, appreciate the value of your cry. Because we have done depreciated it. 
Because for everything we use Christ. And because of that, we may not have the result that we ought to have when you cry. You know, even in Indian society, there is a big thing that uh, the girls in the house, uh, they are not to cry. If they cry, they bring bad luck. That is the, 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 the typical belief. Don't make the girls cry. If you make the, your siblings that are girls, if you make them cry, you're going to inherit ill will into your life. Okay. Wow. Uh, it's probably a manipulation by somebody, but anyway. <laughs> I'm going I'm I'm to leave it like that. Either way, the, you know, uh, there is a power that is, uh, 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 that is connected to your cry, so let us use it in that powerful way. And why I'm talking about cry while I'm talking about grief? If you ever saw, when you are in grief, when you are grieving, the outlet is cry. If you don't cry, then there will be a problem. If you over cry, then there will be a problem. So we have to figure out there is no reason for you to not cry. And many times, even what, what I am trying to go also after, after is, God puts things in your heart that you have to cry. God requires certain things where you have to cry. Lament. You will have to lament. You will have to do that. That is, that is a prerequisite in the kingdom of God. Let me be very clear here. You lamenting is a requirement in the kingdom of God. Probably nobody ever preached on that. In the kingdom of God you need to cry. But it is so clear and true in the Bible. So I'm going to make an attempt to go through all this journey. You know, today is just an introduction. I would like to see and show you a few scriptures. I'm not going to go into the book of Lamentations. But we will go there. As we are going, by the time I'm praying that God will uh, uh, build your vision for your crowd. I think we should get, get to a point. I mean, you, even if you don't understand it, let's declare it by fact, faith. My cry has power. My cry, my cry has, has, power. has power. Come on, let's do it. My, my cry has power. power. When your cry has power, let us use it powerfully. Not just drop. Not just use it for everything and anything. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to tell you something. This will give you even a resilience not to cry when somebody is trying to bully you. My tears are too precious for you. Okay. Are you with me? Amen. That is one of the things that I want to establish. Because your tears are to be cherished. If you don't cherish them, you abuse them. And the church have never learned how to lament the way Jesus wants us to do it. Let's go to the book of Luke, please. Luke chapter 23, starting at verse 26. Can you repeat that? Luke 23, starting at 26. This was happening at the most sorrowful time of Jesus on this earth. When Jesus was on this earth, this was the time. The entire sin of the world is upon him. He is being abused, he is being chastised, he is being uh, hit, he is being mocked, <coughs> what not. Everything is happening. He was abused spiritually, he was abused mentally, he was abused physically. Okay? I want us to understand the weight of the situation. So now the 26th verse, 
This is while he was carrying the cross. All right? Now, as they led him away, <clears throat> they laid hold of a certain man, Simon of Cyrenian, uh, 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 a Cyrenian, uh, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. You know, this always surprises me. <coughs> Isn't carrying the cross Jesus' responsibility? And Jesus is going to let this uh, stranger Simon carry it for him? I always, it always gets me. What is this God? Why? Then, then uh, one day the Holy Spirit have given me a quickening. You think I could have saved you extra if I had done it? It's the same salvation you're going to get. So what, what, what I understood from that, what God gave me as a revelation is, don't struggle for more than you ought to. We take too much on me. I am the mother. I have to do this. No, you don't. Okay. I am so and so. I have to do this. Oh, I can't, you know, even the problems that people have, OCD problems. Oh, I got to clean this. I got to clean this. Otherwise, it's not good. It's not right. It's not appropriate. Who said that? If God didn't require of him to carry the cross all the way through, no need to worry about it. Are you with me? Many times God gives us some help while we are carrying our cross, while we are doing the things that we think are heavy. Take that help. It's okay. It's okay. Many times we don't know how to let Simon do it. Let Simon do it. We got to let it, we, we, we should be okay with it. Oh, it's my burden. It's my, my, no, it's not. It's true. No, it's not. When God is not putting it on you, don't worry about it. Okay. Amen. Thank you. You take too much of responsibility on you that God is not even going to ask you and account for. And instead of you becoming a super fruitful person, you become a resentful person. That is the part of the story, if, the, if you study carefully, the moral in the story of talents. The third one became resentful, so resentful. Because he was assuming too much of a responsibility. If I do something wrong with this thing, my master is going to kill me. He never said anything like that. And as a matter of fact, he attributes to him saying, you are somebody who reaps wrongly. Many times we think our pain, our thing is coming from the Lord and we look at God with a distorted image. Because you assume a little too much of a responsibility. Oh, I need to carry this. Oh, I need to do this. I need to... Oh, 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 no, you don't. No, you don't. Because we still live in the curse mindset. Yeah. Okay. The curse mindset always makes you think you are not worthy unless you die for it. I want to tell you something. There is no cross worth for me to die on other than the one that he called me for. If it is not that, I don't. I don't need to waste one time. God has to um, kind of chastise me in a, in a, in a, as a loving father one day. I, was, I would tell him again and again, Oh Lord, I'll die for you. I'll die for you. I'll die for your gospel. Doesn't matter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. And then he comes to me and he says, why not you live for me? Okay. Wow. Come on now. For a change. Wow. Why not you enjoy life instead of living out of that stress and grief? Wow. Amen? Amen. Amen? That should solve a lot of our grief. We are living under a sorrow that you shouldn't even bear. 
a cross that you shouldn't even bear. We need to let Simon deal with it. You have rejected Simon so much in your life. The timely help that God has sent. Maybe you don't like the way they pick up the cross. Who cares? At the end, cross has to be there. You're, being, you're dying anyway. Simon didn't carry it rightly. Jesus complained about it? No. If I was carrying it, I would be doing it this way. He wasn't doing no demonstration there. I'm getting ready to die. How it got carried, I don't care. Are you with me? I'm, I'm trying to liber uh, liberate you. Some of us, we need that liberation because we are so caught up in that mindset of doing this way or have to do all of this, have to do this. Okay. Who said? Okay. If it ain't God's cross, I'm not bearing it. That's why Jesus time and time again says, cast your cares on me. Your burdens on me. We are trying to many times, this is, many times it, it so bugs me and bothers me when people in some countries where they, they crucify themselves and go on the, whenever this, uh, during this Easter time, they do those kinds of things. It just, I, it, I don't know, my, my whole soul, spirit, everything gets so cringed. Why? Didn't God already do that for us? Yes. Yeah. Didn't Jesus already do that for us? Why do you have to do that? There is no need for you to be suffering. There is no need for you to be bleeding. There is no need for the nails to be going through your, your, your arms and your, your legs and all those kinds of things. There is no need. And, and when we look at that picture, we think, man, they are so stupid. But let me be very honest, you are so stupid too. We may not be doing it to that extent, but we do it. Because we are addicted to suffering. We are addicted to grief. So we embrace it so much. Let me be very clear to you. Learn how to let it go. Learn how to let Simon do it. Simon might be messing it up, but let him do it. Because what is yours is going to come to you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's coming. All right? So anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm coming back to this track right now. And a great multitude of people, 27th verse, and a great multitude of people followed him, and women who also mourned or lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, look at it. These people were crying for Jesus. They saw the king being uh, stripped of everything. They saw the prophet that is going through all this. They saw this is the ultimate one that, that, that we wanted. We, 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 this is the guy who is going to get us out of this mess. He's now being stripped naked and he is being walked in the streets getting ready to be killed. Imagine that picture. In that picture, they were all lamenting. They were crying. And then Jesus immediately turns to them and says, Daughters of Jerusalem, pay attention to that word. Daughters of Jerusalem. Why is it important to, to understand why he is addressing that? I want you to understand something. Jerusalem is the city where Jesus is going to reign from, right? right. You agree? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> he is giving them a position. How to reign. How to rule. No, they're looking. Uh, can I take a moment and go more in this? Look at this. They are looking for a king, right? They're looking for a king who will set them free from their struggle. Whereas Jesus is still doing the same thing, but not the way they wanted it to be done. They're still setting them free. He is still setting them free. And he is still giving them the Jerusalem they wanted. But not the way they are used to. 
They are used to doing it with sword. They are used to doing it with power. They are used to doing it with a war. But instead Jesus is showing a totally different warfare. An everlasting city, right? We're talking about an everlasting kingdom. I want us to understand that part. And he addresses them saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Do not weep for me. There was a time I was watching this movie, Passion of Christ, in the, in the movies. And when I was watching these movies, there were a bunch of nuns that were sitting behind me. We were all watching the movie. And there came a time when Jesus, in that picture they were depicting in that movie, where he was being crucified and the blood is gushing all around and all that is happening. And the, and the nuns were like, ooh, ooh, and, and, and all those reactions and crying and all those kinds of things were happening, seeing that. And for a moment when I saw that, even though I could relate to their reaction, the Holy Spirit was giving me a quickening. Had I not done that, you wouldn't have what you have. That's true. Amen. 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 I wasn't looking for a recognition or a cry from you, but I rather was looking for somebody who can appreciate my pain. Yes. Today you will rejoice because I have gone through that suffering. I've been that on the cross today when he will get, get, get great delight when you can say by his stripes, I am healed. Yes. Instead of us feeling sorry for his pain. That's why even Paul writes, don't worry about our pain and suffering because it's bringing, it is bringing greater joy. Instead of, this is another thing we have to understand, the cross. Why do I have to go through this thing? It's okay, you're going to be rewarded. When we have the mindset, then we won't over, overweigh, overweigh ourselves. Turning the tables. Amen? Amen. How many of you want Jesus to turn the tables? Amen. Mm. And how does he heal us? Look at this. I'll tell you something. God sends his word and heals the land. Amen? Right. When you want healing, how is it going to come? Through his word. <clears throat> We are like Naaman's, we are expecting the, somebody to wave, wave the wand and uh, put some uh, bomb on us, somehow we will be healed. But Jesus is like my word, I'm going to send you my word and that, that will heal you. Amen. The same thing will happen everywhere. He will send forth a word to turn the tables. This is the word that is coming to us so we can be part of turning the tables. Can you be his whip? Can you be his whip? Remember, we are his body, right? Can you be his arm that flips the table? I pray that God will Multiply that vision in you, the revelation in you, so you will understand how to flip the tables. If you are expecting Jesus to flip the tables, it's happening through you. It's happening through you, remember that. Because you are his body. If Jesus is doing, you're doing it. If Jesus is doing, you're doing it. If he is flipping, yeah. you're flipping. Yeah. If he is casting the demons, you're casting the demons. Amen? Amen? Every time you see a table, if you are lifting it up, imagine that. I'm flipping the tables. <laughs> Jesus is flipping along with him. I'm flipping it. And how is he going to do that? He sends a word to you. And as you act on the word, when we are acting on the word, we are flipping the tables. It is happening through us. God says, Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but, but, he didn't say, don't weep at all. But, weep for yourselves and for your children. Weep for yourselves and 
your children. Now I want you to understand this thing. This is not a general statement. He is asking for the daughters of Jerusalem to do this. There is a responsibility that Jesus is dishing out here. Along with an authority. Remember I told you crying is very powerful. That's why Jesus is saying don't waste your tears on something that has to happen. My suffering has to happen. Don't waste your tears on that. When you are suffering or anything like that, don't waste your tears on the suffering. Because suffering is part of your life. Isn't that what he said? In this world you will have suffering, you will have trouble, you will have struggle. So don't waste your tears on that, that is going to happen in your life anyway. Instead use the same tears to flip the tables. Right here he goes, but weep for yourselves and for your children. You need to cry for them. There is a cry that God wants you to have inside of you that is going to flip the tables. It is being given to you as a daughter of Jerusalem, daughter of Zion. Are you with me? Yes. The children of Zion can hear what I am saying here. This is the time for us to operate in that authority. For indeed, look at this, 29th verse. You see, if you don't understand this authority in here, you will not understand what 29th verse is talking about. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts which have never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountain, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. Look at that day. Look at, look at, look at, look at it. What you are taking it for granted, tomorrow it won't even be available. So what Jesus is giving us an opportunity is so you can protect what is going to happen tomorrow. If you don't cry for them today, if you don't cry for yourself, if you don't lament for yourself and your children, I'm again talking about it's not about your physical children alone, but I'm talking about as a daughter of Zion, as, as, as someone that is part of his kingdom. Then they will begin to say, these are for the first words, for if they do these things in the green word, what will be done in the dry. That is a cry God is looking for. As a matter of fact, Jesus wanted you to cry. He could have said, don't cry at all. But instead he says, cry. Cry. I'm praying by the time this, uh, this whole thing is done with, I pray that our hearts will be saturated with a cry that would allow us to flip the tables. The generational curses that are happening around us, the generational manifestations that are happening around us, they don't know. I remember after this, Jesus comes and says the statement after this. If you get a chance, read the rest of the verses where he says, they know, no, they don't know what, they know not what they are doing. Forgive them, Father. Mm -hmm. They know, they don't know what they are doing, what, what the people around us. The people that are celebrating the death of the unborn or the, the people that are celebrating uh, uh, outside of God-given ordinations, ordinances, and things like that out of God's commandments. Well, whoever are celebrating those kinds of things, they don't know. Now the question for all of us is, do you know? If we know, our reaction ought to be, let us lament, let us cry. If this can happen in a green day, what is the dry day going to look like? Think about that. Think about that. 
If you want to ever leave, leave a legacy, that is your legacy worth fighting for. Let's go to John 11, chapter 32nd verse and 37th verse. 237. And I'm trying for us to travel with Jesus. John 11, starting at verse 32. This was after Lazarus was dead. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> that should speak volumes about your grief. We always want God to repair our past. If only this didn't happen in my life. If only this incident didn't take place. If only this responsibility has not fallen on me. If only this accident didn't happen in my life. If only I wasn't divorced. If only my parents have not abused me. If only, if only, if only. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, that, again, the explanation here, the distinction between the weeping and the weeping. I want us to understand here. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Now Jesus wept. Now Jesus wept. He, he wasn't crying in their sorrow. He was crying. All right. He is crying for resurrection. There's a whole, the whole world of difference. Yeah. between these two things. They were crying about yesterday. Jesus is crying about now. How can I turn the tables? He's using his weeping to turn the tables. You can say that he is being a human and crying for his brother. Maybe, maybe not. You, I'll leave it to your imagination. Go for it. But my thing is, he is always compassionate toward people. When he was compassionate toward people, he changed the tune. He went crying to leave it there. So the weeping that he was bringing, the lamentation that he was bringing here, is to resurrect Lazarus. Could you cry for a miracle? Could you cry for a nation that seems dead? Could you cry for your child that seems dead? That is what I'm talking about. Don't cry what has happened yesterday. That is where we are wasting our cry. Jesus didn't partic participate in that cry. Whether you know this or not, Jesus is not in the business of repairing your past. He's in the business of building your future. Okay. Okay. How is he going to build the future without doing the work today? That's why he says, now is the time. Today is the day. Amen? Amen. Um, Jews, Jews said, see how he loved him. And then look at his mockery, they say. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also kept this man from dying? Are you seeing the cry here? They are crying for, for that to not happen. Whereas Jesus was crying for something else to happen. Now the question for us is, what are you crying? What are you crying for? That which has been taken from you? 
Are you still holding the grief of that? Or are you grieving or are you lamenting for what God wants to birth through you? I've seen my wife cry many times. I even saw her cry when she was giving birth to the child. Those two are two different cries. My prayer is that we will be able to differentiate between those cries. Okay. Mm -hmm. Matthew 9 chapter starting at verse 35. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and healing every sickness, every disease among the people. Just as a side note, how many, he, how many sicknesses did he deal with? How many sicknesses? Every sickness. Every sickness. Every sickness. When somebody is trying to lie to you, saying, hey, some he will heal, some he doesn't. That's a lie from pit of hell. Amen. Amen. Yes. I'm going to be very bold about it. Because people are being so lied and lied and lied and we are subduing ourselves and we are subjecting ourselves to these lies again and again and again. And because of that we are not even fighting. You don't know, Pastor, what I am going through, how much I am fighting for my healing. I'm not here to challenge your stats. I know you are fighting. You have. That's why I'm encouraging you to continue to fight. Because he healed every sickness. Amen. Amen. And if I were you, I'll take this scripture to my bed today. You heal every disease, why not mine? Okay. You heal every sickness, why not mine? <clears throat> Why won't you heal mine? Let's, let's lament for that. Yes. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Now the same move he moved when he saw Lazarus. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like a sheep having no shepherd. He didn't tell them to mind their business. He became their business. He moved. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. What is the weeping that God is calling us? A weeping for harvest. A cry for harvest. Therefore, pray. This prayer is not a casual prayer like you and me do. This is a prayer of lamentation. This is a prayer of weeping that Jesus wants you to weep over your children and your children's children and yourself. This is the weeping that Jesus is calling us to. He wants us to pray the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Many times we do this thing very casually. But I'm here to ask us, all of us, to change our perspective about this. This is more of a weeping that needs to come out of your spirit rather than out of your lips. Zechariah 10, starting at verse 1. Zechariah 10, verse 1. As the Lord for rain, in the time of the later rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Come on. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord for rain. 
This is an asking where it requires you to lament. Where you come to that place where you take upon the heart of God and start releasing the heart of God onto this earth. Let it flow. Let it flow. You can never take the burden of the Lord on you unless you lament. It has to come out of you. This is the positioning of daughters of Zion. Daughters of Jerusalem. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. <coughs> I want us to understand this thing carefully. Ponder on it. This is exactly what is happening in our society right now. They are taking comfort in false dreams. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Therefore the people went their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. shepherd. Remember what was Jesus asking Peter? Can you shepherd my sheep? Mm. He wasn't asking, can you preach for them? Mm. Jesus identified himself as shepherd. Yes. When David was talking about it, he was uh, uh, he relates to God as his shepherd. Can you be that shepherd? Mm. Matthew 23. Starting at verse 37. This is all introduction. Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem. Look at this is Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem. Oh Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, that one who kills the prophets and stones um, those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you or desolate. For I say to you, I shall see, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba besham Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba besham Adonai. He has a heart. Remember he was traveling to the cities, through the cities. When he was going through the villages, the towns, the cities, everything, he was looking for something. Can this city have a shepherd? Can somebody shepherd these sheep? In other words, I would like to put it this way. Can somebody cry for these people? Can somebody cry for this city? Can somebody cry for this nation? There are meanings of the la uh, lament which would mean to feel, show, or express grief, sorrow, or regret, to mourn deeply. But the one meaning that I really like is to mourn aloud. To mourn aloud. The voices out there are talking destruction and desolation. Every day. Every day. The voices of drugs are saying, I'm going to have your child. The voices of porn are saying, I'm going to have your grandchild. The voices are saying that. Can we have the voice that would be allowed? The cry that can be more loud. I can't let this happen, Lord. Can you heal our children? Can you heal our grandchildren? Can you heal our schools? Can you heal our land? For they know not what they are doing. 
Instead of being judgmental and critical toward them, let us cry for them. Okay. <coughs> that is what the Lord has asked us. Lament for yourself and for your children. That's a cross you should take up on. When we don't cry, when we don't understand this part of God, this part of the requirement in the kingdom of God, our prayers become ineffective. We need to learn how to weep. How to weep. That's why I want to study on the book of Lamentation. I can cry all I want for my dead parents, they're not coming back. But I can divert that same cry for somebody who is addicted in porn. That is ruining their life. Someone that is addicted to cocaine. Someone addicted to ganza. Someone ruining their marriage because they are addicted to adultery. I can cry for them. And that's my prayer today. Hope you got something out of this and I pray that God will multiply this in our lives and prepare our hearts. Next week, we will start, most likely, God willing, the first chapter of Lamentations. Start studying it, if you can. Thank you. All right? Love you, God bless you. Let's come prepared to be God's, I, mean, I think it sounds silly, but I'm gonna say, it. let us become God's crybabies. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of practice. We're gonna, we're, we're, yes, yes. We're gonna, we're gonna, <coughs> we're gonna bring a total new meaning for cry baby. Yes, I got that down. We have cried for ourselves too much. We have, we have, we have been stuck in that grief a little too long. Maybe it's time for us to change the focus. We were stuck in the past too long. Crying for a past that had left you years ago. Yes, sir. No matter how much you tried, you could never go back there. Don't want to. It's still there. <laughs> so let's look for something God is building. And all the mothers that feel so bad what is happening right now in the society. It wasn't like that when I was there, when I was growing up. But I'm here to encourage you, you could make it even better. You could even make it better now. And that's what I believe Jesus is mandating us to do. Amen? Amen. May the Lord enrich us. May, lo may the Lord strengthen us. May the Lord continue to grow us in the knowledge of His, his will. God bless you. Love you. We love you. Looking forward to seeing you again. Bye.